Thank you very much for joining me. I'm Nola Simon. I'm the host of the Hybrid Remote Center of Excellence, and I am pleased today to have Karen Eber, who is the author of The Perfect Story, and somebody that I met on Twitter. Uh, she's actually a storyteller, she's a consultant, and an author. Is there something else in your introduction that I'm missing? Uh, I'm a piccolo player. That's <laughs> the most important one. I play the piccolo. No, that's all goodness. <laughs> that's the kind of unique detail that people should remember. Yeah. Karen and I actually have something odd that's in common. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how we met. We actually met on Twitter. And one of the things that we started talking about, there was one day I was talking about, I actually shared my story and it was published in a book called You've Got Quirks. I've done another podcast with the author of that, Kristen Cherry. And I was talking about the questions that people ask me because my eyes are different colors right? And Karen started engaging and we we're just like, oh my God, like you have the same similar sort of experience. So do you want to talk a little bit about your experience? It's all I've known. As long as I've had awareness as a human, I've had different colored eyes. They were blue as most infants have. And then they started to change different colors around probably six months. And so I've loved this. It's been the thing that when you have to tell something interesting about yourself, got mine, I know what that is. But I found that most people didn't know what to make of it. Like you can tell, I know you've had this experience where you're talking <laughs> to someone in conversation and their words come to a halt and you see their eyes, like the brain is trying to decide which eye to look at. And then the barrage of questions would start of what did you know you have two different color eyes as if I wouldn't know, right? Do you know I have a dog like that? Or David Bowie has two different color eyes. And then they would start questioning, what color eyes do your mom or dad have? And do you see different colors out of each eye? That one's my favorite. Like I literally yeah. was just going to say that one. <laughs> Do your eyes give you special powers? I'm like, do your eyes give you special powers? And so the questions would get more and more ridiculous. The saying of there's no bad question. There is. When someone is questioning your physical appearance in some way, like that's not a good question. And so this thing that I love then became this really awkward thing where they would then start calling people over. And I felt like I was a sideshow because they would be like, come here, you've got to see her eyes. And eventually it would get to how did that happen? And I just got so tired of it that I told this story about how when I was four years old, I had brown eyes. I was in my room coloring one night with that box of crayons. We all throw our crayons into the perfect ones, the peeled ones, the broken ones. I reached into the box and pulled out a green crayon and it didn't really smell like anything, but I tasted it and I liked the texture. So I ate the crayon and then I ate every green crayon in the box. And the next day I woke up and my left eye was green. <laughs> I thought that was incredibly creative. I was like, I should have done something like that. <laughs> so yeah, what do you do? What are the questions you get? So my experience is a little different because I also have Wardenburg syndrome. So my eye is related to Wardenburg syndrome because that's actually a difference of pigmentation throughout my body. So when I was little, I started developing like a streak of white hair in the front and I have different pigmentation. I'm not sure if you can see it on my arm. Mm -hmm. So, and it's genetic. So my daughter has it as well too. Like when she was born, it looked like her left leg had just being dipped in milk. It was just that slight bit different color, but it's interesting because people would see my hair before they would see my eyes. And I'm also mm -hmm. deaf in one ear too. So I have Lots of entertainment going on. So people would see my hair before they would see my eyes. My eyes are blue and green. So I find that's a lot different than the brown eye experience. The brown eye is a lot more vivid. I have a cousin in Germany who has a brown eye and a blue eye. And so she has conveyed stories to me through other people that people stop her and they see that very visibly. But for me, it's often dependent on the light. So it would happen a, a lot of times over lunch. If I was sitting like across from somebody at a table, the light would change and they would just stop cold. And it'd be like, oh, the light is effective. Like you've noticed my eyes are different colors now. And then I would tell the whole story about the difference of pigmentation, right? But I used to get called grandma. Uh, because of the white streak when I was a little. So the focus was always more on my hair. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the interesting part was when we actually got into history and we covered the Salem witch trials and there was a whole thing about the way that witches were treated 
And if there was different colored pigmentation on their skins, it was uh, often thought to be an entry point of the devil. Yeah. In the Salem witch trials, I would not have fared very well. No. <laughs> so a lot of times it actually changed through a context when the Marvel movies came out and Storm became a thing. That was also uh, very um, interesting because I find that it goes in the cyclical cycle. So a lot of times white hair, streaks of white, different colored eyes are a lot of times associated with evil. In storytelling it's like a mark of, of evilness and so i was like oh there cool. are some people that would probably agree with that <laughs> yeah like you it often comes up in, in superhero movies so the whole marvel thing is being a an entertainment right so yeah and yeah. it's so interesting too because really what's just happening is you're different and the person's brain doesn't know what to do with it and right. so these ridiculous questions come out and it creates this moment that is just awful and i think everybody has a moment where they feel different yeah. And that's not always enjoyable. Yeah. And I found when I told the story, I shifted the energy and took that power back. So I'm impressed you went the honest route. I went the sarcastic route of, let <laughs> me tell you the most ridiculous story. But what was always funny is that people, I'd finish the story and I would be quiet and people would look at me and they, I could see their brain, like trying to make sense of, is she for real or not? I don't right. know if this story is true or not. And yeah, that's why I put a crayon on the book. Yeah, no, I thought that was amazing. And the fact that your dad actually did like a whole cutting board with the book. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have it there? Yeah. Oh, he that's so cool. My husband is a carpenter. Way. So when you were like, oh, it's lasered on and I'm like, oh yeah, I know how this works. So, yeah. <laughs> but it's such a good job. He did such an amazing thing. Yeah. No, I loved that you had that on your, on your book. So that's how we actually met because when you actually have that type of common experience, People don't think it's a really big deal, but sometimes it is. It, in, it, it affects your sense of belongings. Even simple questions, like I remember when I went to go get my driver's license and you fill out forms and you're like, what's your eye color? And I'm like, I remember asking them what they wanted me to put. I and always just do hazel. I, so I picked blue because the, my blue eye is my favorite eye color. And like the guy was just like, I don't care. Like just okay. <laughs> right. whatever you right. want, lady. But, but it's, it's like, the same thing, like even avatars or emojis or all of that. Thanks. You don't get to do this. And I was on a podcast where they very kindly drew an image of me and got the eye color wrong. And is it a big deal? No, but it's a part of your identity. And so after a while, it's I'm coming from an incredibly privileged place because there's a lot of people that are getting biases against them or they are not mm -hmm. being included for for reasons and things that are far more painful. But when you're not included and you're treated as weird, it is never fun. Yeah. Yeah. And it it's even on a story that was actually about my experience. So the book you've got quirks, it's represented. There's it's cartoon, it's for kids, right? They switched my eyes. And it's, yes. And uh, so at, at that point, it had been published once I realized, but it's okay, what do you do? But I'm looking at that and I'm like, but that's endemic of the situation, right? Because people who, and honestly, I find it with hearing as well too, because most people, the default is you've got hearing in two ears, right? Or you're deaf, right? There's right. not really a lot of support out there and a lot of stories about what it's like to have unilateral hearing loss, right? I find that's interesting as well too. So the thing about- I did have when, one quick note. I did have a really cool moment this past year. I got to give a keynote to ophthalmologists and I was ooh. like, hello, I'm a heterochromia. And they all understood what that meant. It was so nice. Oh my God. Yeah. People do not know what that word means at all. Mm -hmm. And so it was so funny because it when you find people who actually understand or who have similar experience that you latch onto. I remember finding a, an Instagram page for Wardenberg syndrome. And I was looking at all of these pictures of the, these people who look like me. And I can't, I couldn't explain it because it's, I've never seen anybody who really looked like me. Um, I, because you almost never meet somebody who has like the streak of white or the different colored eyes and, and like to have a visual representation and see hundreds of different people like that. It was like, Oh my God, it's right? It's, yeah. So I found Instagram because there's a heterochromia hashtag for Instagram as well too. But like you said, before we actually started recording, it's hard to record. It's hard to take pictures of. Yeah, it is very hard. 
Uh, yeah. By the way, for everyone listening, July 12th is National Different Colored Eyes Day. We're going to say North America region, not just any one, any one country. Mark this on your calendars and send love to your favorite heterochromians in July. <laughs> what you do on that day, I don't know, but I always feel a little special to, to know it's out there. Yeah, I didn't know it existed before you shared that. So that was fun too. So yeah, that's how Karen and I bonded really is the fact that we we both have this odd kind of experience. But that and the, the fact other thing we both care about workplaces and organizational culture, that little thing too. Yeah, that, that, yeah, exactly. Like we we do tend to talk about the same things as well too. And I, I do have a thing about storytelling. I was telling Karen before we started talking that her book is written in such a way and with such discipline that she's woven the stories throughout to keep making different points relating back to those stories. And I can't tell you how impactful that is to really choose specific stories to really bring out the best in your points. And it's the rare author who has the ability to do that. So I only can think of Amy Edmondson, who's done that before too. And I was really impressed with the discipline that it took you to do that and to eliminate the stories, especially when you're somebody who has really created a depth of stories and you have trackers and you have like a whole data bank really of stories to choose from. It's really challenging to really be specific and choose that. So how did that come to be? Was that something that you, when you started writing the book, that you knew you wanted to be very specific with those stories? The biggest shift that came when I started writing the book is my agent said, I think we need to dissect a story throughout the book. And I immediately knew I want to take my TED talk and do that because it's not only going to show you a story in writing, but if people then want to go and see that story told and see some of the choices and what happens when you tell a story versus have it in writing, it's there. And it's a story about a, a woman, Maria, who drops her phone down an elevator shaft and a parallel story about the CEO of Charles Schwab, who makes a, a life lesson in university. And so those stories I share early on and then throughout the book come back to, to show what are the different considerations that go into them as we go through different pieces. The rest of the stories were more as I work through the different pieces, I, some I knew I wanted to include and some just came to me when I sat down to write it. I thought, okay, I know the right story to use, but really once I came back to the idea of you're right, it's going to be helpful to dissect a story throughout and how great would it be to use the opening story of my TED talk? Because a lot of people have found me through that. And so it's a story they're familiar with, because I also didn't want to do a story that you read and then you forget about, and you have to keep going back to read because it's referenced throughout the book and you can't remember what it's about. So that I think helped it all give the structure that was going to be really meaningful to people that are trying to think about different nuances in a story. Yeah, no, I think you got excellent advice there because I got to tell you, the first thing I did was watch your TED Talk because I knew it was going to be referenced and yeah. it really made it impactful. One of the advice that one of the pieces of advice that I give people is be bingeable. So I found that it really added a depth of content because you're really binging on the layers of content that you've built out, right? And especially when you actually use that story and you started talking about the hand gestures and how you actually embody the stories. Yes. Yeah. That really made a difference because I watched the speaker reel this morning, actually, just to prepare as well. And I, I really noticed it actually when I was watching the speaker reel, because I'm like, oh, she's pushing the elevator buttons and she's on this side and you, yeah. you shift that perspective to, to embody different characters. And so I thought that was genius too, because the point that you made in the book was some people can do voices, but that comes with danger because can you do it reliably? Are you going to offend anybody? So using your body to embody different characters and shifting positions, I thought was a, a really great tip on how to illustrate dialogue. Yeah. And it was important to me, not just to show how do you get ideas and how do you construct it, but recognizing that if you are telling the story there is all of these considerations in terms of your inflection, your pace, your gestures, the way you are bringing people into the story that is so much a part of it. And constructing a story is one thing, but a story on the page is different than the way a story is told live. And so I thought it was going to be a helpful way to be able to give some of those visuals. 
Yeah, I really found that it was really uh, impactful. And the other point that was really effective in the book too is you have to remember that your audience is actually going to, there's a story you tell, but it's the story that the audience receives. So the fact that you're embodying it and you're giving them gestures helps you ensure that they're going to receive more of the message you intend and less of the assumption, I think. Yeah. I think that's I mean, true. So you mentioned that there's some gestures in the story. So the story starts with this woman, Maria, walking into an elevator. So I step forward and I pretend I'm pushing a button in the elevator. And when her phone falls, my hand falls and I make the sound of the whoosh. And all of that is, you already have the events of the story, but these are little things that are starting to now dynamically engage your senses. And so your brain is seeing these things. You're picturing an elevator that you've been in and you're like visualizing your phone falling out of your hands. And so each of these things do play a dynamic role in the experience of that story. And really what they're doing is it's making the listener spend more calories. You're drawing them into the story. So they are feeling like they are experiencing it themselves. Yeah, no, I thought that was really cool. I actually wanted to tell you a, a story that I tell and it gets a reaction just because it, there's a psychosomatic reaction that happens. So when my kids were little, the school board went after them and kept sending them home because they had lice. So as soon as you start talking about lice, people start scratching their heads. And so it's quite funny because I watch for that reaction when I tell that story, because when people start reacting like that, I know I've caught, I've hooked them. Especially if you even throw a word in about it, right? Yeah, that's so true because yeah. you're immediately having our brains light up like, oh my gosh, can I feel the lice on my head or whatever? Right. Or it's the smell of the tea of tree is. oil and the crying and the, if you've ever had to detangle a, you know, a five-year-old here. <laughs> not fun. It's, it's, it's stressful. And like the shame and embarrassment because I had to have the principal check my hair because at one point it kept going on for so long. They're like, are you the carry? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. I was mortified. That story I find is really a story that I can tell if I really want to get physical reactions out of people. And right. And if I set it up well enough so that they can understand the stress and the heartache and everything that went, they're immediately supportive of what I did afterwards, which was I pursued changing the policy for 18 months because I didn't want anybody else to go through with it. And I got it changed and it benefited 180,000 kids in our school board for the last 10 years. So probably Amazing. over a million people have right. benefited from the fact that I was like, you don't get to do this to anybody else. Good for you. Yeah. So that's one of my power stories that I tell. <laughs> I'm trying to be very conscious not to adjust my hair during all of this so that I'm not trying to sit very still. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I know. It's impactful. I wanted to ask you about the the book. When you submitted it, you, you submitted it for blurbs. And I am such a fan of the blurbs that you got because I'm looking at this list and I'm like, it's Adam Grant and it's Daniel Pink. Somebody actually asked me who Daniel Pink was and I'm like, I can't help you. <laughs> You have to go yeah. discover him all yourself. And then of course, the, the one that I was really drawn to is Amy Edinson, because I really like her writing. So can you tell me some of the stories? Because there's Dory Clark on the list. These are like the who's who. If I had a dream book of who I would want to blurb my book, these are the people that I would go to too. So how yeah, did that Dory, experience Dory and I know each other peripherally, and she was so kind and generous to do that, as was Randy Zuckerberg, Paul Zach. If you are in the storytelling community, he is beloved and is so kind and generous. And I've worked closely with him and his team because I, I do talk about their research and some of the leading edge things they have in the book. Francis Fry has been a hero for the longest time. We were so close to being able to have her be a storyteller interview and it just didn't work out schedule wise. And I was so grateful when Francis lent a quote or a blurb. Marshall Goldsmith, mm -hmm. he's classic. And so I, I appreciated that. But the three that are really probably the most interesting stories are Dan, Adam, and Amy. You reach out and you don't ever really quite know what's going to happen. And Dan got back to me in a day, which is amazingly unheard of. The more famous the people, the faster they got back. Um, and he let me know he was on a blurb moratorium because he had a special project going on and he couldn't take it on, which certainly understand and, and no expectations. 
But then he kindly said, if you can give me a generous deadline, then I'll see if I can fit this in. And he broke his blurb moratorium and gave me this incredible blurb, which was so very kind of him. Amy, she, again, you get the equivalent of maybe 140 characters to, to connect with her through the Harvard website. And then you end up in this abyss of her inbox, which is just bombarded. And I was delighted when she wrote back and asked for the manuscript and still didn't know what would happen. And probably three days later, I got an email from her that just said, oh, Karen, it's so good. And it's seven o'clock at night. And I happen to look at my email and I see this. And at this point, Amy was the first person that really didn't know me who was reading the book. And not to mention my opinion of her is up here. And I'm like secretly delighted that my book will be next to hers on bookshelves. Yeah. She's my book neighbor, whether she likes it or not. (laughs) And so she said, I still have more to read, but I just want to stop and tell you how much I'm enjoying the book. It's really masterful. And I just thought, how kind, like how kind to stop and send a note. And, and so I was crying so hard at that point, my husband came over thinking something was wrong. And I just handed him my phone because I couldn't talk. And so that I remember thinking that day, no matter what happens with this book, I've already won because Amy Edmondson's now my friend. <laughs> it was really amazing. And then Adam, you get through and he immediately lets you know that he's only able to blurb maybe 5% of the manuscripts he requests. That's not even the requests he got in the manuscript scripts he requests. And so there were many back and forth and it was coming down to the deadline and I needed to send a reminder and those are always awkward to write. (laughs) And so I went on ChatGPT and I said, I have to send this reminder message. What do I do? And ChatGPT was terrible as it always is. And it said, you should call, hey, blurb maestro. So it's almost time for the blurb. And like, how about being a maestro and writing a great, I was like, it was terrible. But I write the reminder of just wanting to let, if you're able to do this, I need it by this date. P.S. ChatGPT, right? these messages can be awkward. So I asked Chat, Chat GPT what I should write. And it said, I should call you Blur Maestro. And so he's, I'll see if I can get to it. Signed it Blur Maestro, which was super That's cute. That's funny. Him. The deadline came and it went and I didn't have his blurb and I certainly understood and I moved forward. And then July 3rd at eight o'clock at night, something said, go check your email on my phone. I don't know why, but I open up my email and there is Adam. And he said, is it too late to submit a blurb? Now the book, actually, I had gotten the cover that day and was going to press the day after the, the, on July 5th. I was like, wow. literally could not have been any later. And I said, and if you can get it to me. I will run to the printers myself. And so that we did a, a last minute working it into it. And it was an incredible blurb. And it was so amazing that he continued, even knowing he had missed the deadline. And and I pulled some strings and was very grateful for my publisher to make that work because it, it's really lovely. But it's always, there's always a story behind all of these. Oh yeah, no, and that's why I was, I need to know how you managed to get these because this is really super cool. And I know what you mean about Amy Anderson. I actually shared something of her and she commented on LinkedIn and responded to me. And I was like, did you screenshot it? Is that what? Did you screenshot it? Oh God, of course. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, She's very like, what is what you get with her? She's very genuine. And you see why she has led the cause on psychological safety and just how she treats people yeah in a really authentic and warm way yeah I I gotta admit that I did actually put out a hey if you'd ever like to be on a podcast because I know your new book is coming out (laughs) I'd love to have you so go through for everyone listening you you can't always get through but if you go through the contact information I know she does try to do what she can you never know no, I know. Yeah. I, I wanted to, to know how you did that, but I wanted to celebrate the fact that you got so many. And as I said, it's a who's who really super cool. I love that. Yeah, and that's great I, about him because honestly, like that week of July 4th is, it's the hard week. <laughs> I work with Americans for years and almost nobody is really around that week. So that yeah. deadline, that's and, impressive. You know, he probably was finalizing his own manuscript at the yeah. same time because our books are just a few weeks apart. Yeah. It's always... Um, blurbs are such an interesting thing in book publishing and anytime someone lends their name is just such a, a wonderful support. 
Oh, I know. Yeah, I had no idea, no understanding really of what went into actually getting author's blurbs. And I'm my next guest tomorrow, I'm actually recording with David Perkis, which is really nice. super cool because he wants to be the next Daniel Fink. And it's funny because I started following him because he had blurbed my coach, Carrie Twig. I didn't know who he was beforehand. So he doesn't even know this story. So this is a story I get to tell him tomorrow is like your blurb is why I'm connected to you. <laughs> oh, how neat. Yeah. That's one of the things I really like about podcasting is you actually develop this whole like kind of network effect. And I've noticed that some of my 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 stories and my episodes really connect back and, and throw back to each other. And it's, I don't know if anybody else is noticing this because I don't know if you never know who's listening and who's not, but I'm like, oh, cool. I'm noticing all of these themes and these connections. So nice. You've done like 50 podcasts, right? For this book launch. Yeah, I think I'm on 53 or 54. Wow. I stopped counting after a while. But I yeah. guess so. Yeah, you're out. How many? Because you've got a Spotify playlist with guest episodes. How many guest episodes can you get in a Spotify playlist? You can just add it. It's just a playlist. It's not all of them are on Spotify. So it's not yeah. a complete list and not all of them are out That's yet. True. But I have a podcast page and always try to share them in my newsletter and put them up. But a lot of times people ask me, how do I get started with storytelling? And I'm like, go to this playlist, pick any episode, <laughs> dig in. There's so much goodness in all of the conversations. And each one is fun because sometimes it's for the financial industry and sometimes it's real estate and sometimes it's culture and sometimes it's entrepreneurs. And it's, I just love the different angles because what I want to do is make storytelling accessible no matter your industry and give people a model and a set of tools that allow them to make the choices for what's right for them versus forcing people into something like the hero's journey, which is the same type of story over and mm. over that may or may not work for them. Yeah, that's actually cool. So what have you learned about being a podcast guest? <laughs> Come with so stories. Yeah. Listen. Yeah. My favorite ones are like this, where it's a dialogue because it's more fun and more of our personalities and it feels more organic. I love when I get to also ask questions and hear about your experiences because then we're going to banter and build on each other. Yeah. Uh, there's somewhere the hosts do most of the talking and that's okay too. The biggest thing is I always want to build an idea for the host audience and whatever audience I can bring to it. I, I don't want to just go on there and talk. I want to share things that are meaningful and have someone come away and be like, oh, that's really interesting. Let me, let me look this person up. So I try hard to do that in each one. That's good. That's how I like it too. And I try not to be the host who talks as much. I, I find it hard listening back sometimes because I'm like, I talk way too much. <laughs> You don't but trust me. I uh, <laughs> leave it at that. You don't. <laughs> You're always your worst critic, right? But there was actually one part of your book that I wanted to talk about because that's actually something that's coming out with Amy's new book. I love her title, by the way. The the, the, the name of her new book is called The Right Kind of Wrong, which makes it mm -hmm. sound like this wonderful romance, but it's about failing well. And you actually tell a story in your book, which I actually thought could have been used as an example in her book, about a time that you blanked on the TED stage. Could yeah. you tell us that story? Sure. There is a program at, at TED where they were developing an app to teach people how to give a talk. And so this was several years ago before I gave the talk that ended up on TED.com. I was a beta tester in the this development of the app that walked through a series of steps. As a thank you, they invited people to TED headquarters who had been involved in the beta test to debrief more of the experience and to give them the TED experience, get the tour, stand on the circle. And a week before the event, they invited three people who had been beta testers to give a talk on the stage. And I was one of them. And I was super excited, but I had one week. Most TED Talks, you have six months, you're practicing all the time. And, and so I'm practicing everywhere in the backyard, in my car, at the gym, even in the New York Public Library. And on the day, I am counting down the moments to get on stage and, and stand in the circle. And once they call my name, I get there, I start doing the talk and it's going, there's Things are going smoothly and I, I round the corner into the last probably quarter of the talk and my mind just went blank in that moment. There wasn't anything I didn't like about that piece. I, I'm not even sure why it happened, but my brain was like, we're just going to take a time out right here. Unfortunately, 
I wasn't done with my talk and I didn't panic. And I thought in improv, they say, if you go blank, you should look someone in the eye because that'll prompt your thinking. A friend of mine was in the second row. And so I looked her in the eye and nothing. (laughs) So I look over here and I see a stranger over here and I look him in the eye and we're in a stadium of 200 people. It's packed. I look the stranger in the eye and nothing. And so I then start to think, wow, I might actually have to do what they say in improv as the second role, if you blank, which is fall on the ground. And so at this (laughs) point, I'm like looking at the red circle on the ground, thinking like, do I need to fall down here? And we're past the point of a little awkward pause. We're now in uncomfortable silence. Like it's been 10, 15 seconds. And so I'm just trying to, again, not panicked, but trying to think of where I was or what to do. And I look down and the audience started applauding. They gave the empathy applause of, oh no, you can do this. But in my mind, it was the pity applause of like, oh, she blanked. And there was something about that moment that just kicked my brain into gear because it's, no, I'm not done. I'm not, stop your applause. We're going to be fine. And so I picked back up where I left off, finished strong. And while I had spent the whole day counting down the minutes to get on stage, I was trying to get off the stage as quickly as I could because this is not how I saw this going. I'm a keynote speaker. I regularly give talks. I did not think that I would be blanking on this TED stage and what felt like the most mortifying experience. And as I get off stage, a TED employee sees me and comes up and says, I really liked your talk. And I was like, okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. And she said, she said, no, you recovered better than most people do. And I didn't really pay attention. And I left. And a week later, I am scrolling Instagram and I see a post from someone who had been there that day, but I hadn't met. And this person quoted my talk. And I left that experience feeling awful. I was embarrassed that I blanked and I felt like I hadn't built this idea, which was the whole point of a TED talk. Yet here I am a week later, this person that I never met is remembering something from my talk and quoting it. And I thought, that's interesting. Like maybe it wasn't as bad as I thought. A few months later, I was back at TED headquarters. They were for a different program to to help on something and they gave us a tour. And at one point in the tour, they said, this is where we edit the talks. And I'm like, you edit the talks? They said, yeah, of course. Like people blank all the time. They have to go get water. They forget where they are. They want to check their notes. Like it happens all the time. We just edit them for time. No one wants to see dead air like that. And that's when I realized we hold these TED Talks as like the most perfect speaking experiences and what everyone aspires to, but even many of them aren't what we think they are because they have to edit them for time and effectiveness. And I realized like this story I had been telling myself of, I failed, I didn't build an idea, how awful was so wrong because I was more relatable to that audience because I was real and authentic and that's what they responded to. It's not the perfection and the most perfect delivery. It's when people feel like, oh, I'm getting the genuine person here. And that blanking was such a gift because I'm no longer afraid of that anymore. I, I know many people share that as a public speaking fear. It's not one of mine. And I have learned to approach and have fun with them and was so grateful when I did have the opportunity to get an actual TEDx to to have a different experience and really enjoy it. But yeah, it's one of those moments that felt like such failure. And then when you look at it, you realize that wasn't failure at all. Why did I think that? Yeah. It's it's important the story that you tell yourself. And the point that you made in the book too is like comedians often have jokes that just don't land and they don't land in that moment. They try it again. Uh, it, it, it's going to come across differently to a different audience in a different moment. So to keep going and have fun of it and make fun of something that doesn't quite go right and work it in and use it as an example later on. And so I thought that was a brilliant story to tell, especially since you you are actually a, like a speaking coach, right? It really just made your advice really resonate and your point about being vulnerable in in, in increasing trust is such an important leadership advice that I don't think enough people take. So yeah, much of my work is really working with C-suite on how are they establishing trust in their organization? How are they helping shape 
their culture by demonstrating what is encouraged or discouraged. And so there is a, a big cultural piece of this from my background in, as being a head of culture and, and a business in GE. But there's also a communications piece of this too, because they go hand in hand. You don't shape a culture. You don't create a workplace that where people can thrive without thinking about what you're saying and how you're saying it and how you're building trust. And so I always say I'm building leaders, teams, and culture one story at a time because they're all hand in hand. Yeah. And before we actually start to wrap up, there was one question I wanted to ask you, and that's about the mandates. So you have a beautiful chapter on how storytelling can actually be manipulative. And yeah. that's actually something that I see come out in a lot of the articles that happen around hybrid or remote. There's an agenda, there's a manipulation that's happening in terms of the narrative that people want to spread. And so could you talk a little bit about how that manipulative piece of storytelling can actually erode trust? Yeah, I, I get the question. I think you probably get the same exact question of when do I tell a story or how do I communicate this? Oh, we're going to return to office. What's the story I should tell? You shouldn't. You shouldn't. If you were trying to dress up a decision, a policy, a mandate, and a story, you will immediately lose, just lose the trust of your workforce because they're going to feel like you are trying to give propaganda. You are trying to dress up a situation that doesn't feel genuine. People sniff out things that don't feel realistic. So anytime there's a decision like that, you want to just communicate it. Treat people like adults. Tell them what the decision is and what's expected of them. Anytime you are really trying to think, what's the story I can tell to make this more digestible? It's probably not a moment to tell a story because it's not about making something digestible. Stories are going to help you understand about what some great leaders do in your organization or the, the things that teams are doing that create wonderful workplaces or accomplish great things. Those are the stories that you want to be intentional about telling in your culture or about the, the mistakes you've made and what you've learned from them. But the moment you start trying to dress up decisions, policies, mandates, and a story is the moment you're going to lose your audience and people sniff out that. And the moment they detect that you lose that trust and it is almost impossible to regain. Yeah, absolutely. And I had that actually a, a large government organization came to me and they wanted, they had decided to force a return to office mandate and they wanted to bring me in as a speaker to convince people why that was a good thing. And yes, it's a, it's a great gig, but at the same time, it's ethically, I don't agree with return to office mandates. I do not think that it should be mandate, but I have lived through an office mandate. So my challenge was, how can I actually do this in such a way that it's going to be true to me ethically? And the only way that I can really come up with a story or a presentation that would work to fulfill their goal of engaging their employees and allowing me to tell my story was to really talk, lean into my story itself and just basically look at the emotions and the process that I went through. Because if I hadn't lived through a return to office mandate, I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing now. Yeah. yeah. How do you change the perspective of, mm -hmm. yes, this is going to suck immediately, but how can you leverage it in such a way that strategically, if you're looking longer term, what can this lead to? Powerful That's the only about, way I can tell this story. <laughs> yeah. And what's powerful about you telling that story is you helped the employees feel seen because you're expressing emotions that they're feeling. But I bet you also shifted the thinking of the leaders who are like, oh, I didn't think about that. Oh, you're right. I should watch for that. Okay. It's helpful to, excuse me, it's helpful to ground myself with what my people might be feeling. Like you, you put empathy in at different levels, which is very much needed. Yeah. And it almost becomes like what to watch for and how to navigate this versus exactly. here's why this is so great. Because return to office mandate is, is awful on so many levels, right? It's yeah. awful fitting at people as an individual, but people also for, often forget the leaders who are actually asked to enforce the mandates. Those are the people who tend to actually have families and caregiving <laughs> obligations, and they may personally not appreciate the mandate, but they're required to actually enforce it. And so you have to appeal to them as a person, but also a leader, because they're being asked to do almost an impossible job yeah. in, and enforce something that they truly don't actually believe in. So how do you support and empower somebody who's in a no-win situation? <laughs> and that's the only way that I could tell a story. 
And I actually didn't actually get to tell it because, well, they went on strike and everything just disappeared. But hey, hopefully they've got a better better scenario going. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I am adding structure into the podcast because I'd had feedback from guests that they wanted to have certain things where we could like be guaranteed that we would cover. So one of the questions I ask is actually about questions. What is your go-to question that really gets a response that resonates? It's almost like you get a full body answer. My lawyer, for example, when my job was restructured, acted, asked me if I was being set up for success and it was like a full body. No, I could just feel it in every part of my body. Do you have a question like that? Do you find that you find effective? I do. It's whether it's with an individual or a a leader or a team, I will encourage them to ask people, how would your friends and family describe work here? During the pandemic, we sat alongside our friends and family and those of us that were virtual and they watched us work and they saw the good moments and the bad moments of the job. And when when you ask employees, you only get responses to the questions asked. But you, if you ask employees, like, how would your friend, friends and family describe your work here or this company? It's an immediate visceral reaction, leaders and teams alike, and it equips them to go ask and learn. It's not I think the fear is always, oh my gosh, it's going to be terrible. It's not. There's often really nice recognition of the the opportunities or growth that someone had or the great leaders and then the the challenges. And so I find that when people and, and companies are looking to think about how they are making dynamic shifts in their culture, that one cuts through the noise and it gets really real on what is working for us and what isn't. Yeah. I actually look at a a different question. It's a similar sort of question, but it's like, how do you introduce somebody when you're actually just walking your dog? What do you tell them about your work? And I find that's actually illuminating uh, that question as well too. Yeah. So what's your favorite vision for the future? So the work that you do now, if we take it and we look five, 10 years in the future, what's your favorite vision of the impact of the work that you do now? I think part of the reason that companies are struggling with things like return to office is a little bit of a dated mindset. So, so much of work through maybe the early 90s was about sameness. You were hiring people for roles, not individual talents. And the roles were, it was all the same. We go to an office and we work on teams and everything was done pretty much the same. And then this recognition came in that it's not about sameness. It's really about the unique talents that we can bring together. And those have become more and more finite as we have deep expertise and we're able to automate some things. And so now you are looking at, a workforce where people are hired for very specific reasons and experience and knowledge. And how do we harness that? Which means we can't rely on global decisions to apply for everyone. And so things like return to office tend to dilute this consideration for what is really most meaningful for this team or this person, or what do we really need to do to come together? As I look towards the future, It's about individualization. And I don't mean over-rotating where we're catering to each individual person on every single thing, but it's a focus of we are gathering of individuals with specific skills meant to do certain things. And how do we harness that in the best way versus sameness, which is where I think a lot of the decisions are being made today. And how do we do that in an equitable and inclusive way? I love that. I talk about personalization a lot too. And you're right. It's not about tweaking everything to the individual, but it's like, where are the places that you can, because you want people to be seen and heard and personalization, that individualization, that makes people feel seen and heard. I feel like return to office decisions are being made for real estate and they're being made for the weakest link, which is the manager that doesn't know how to develop in different ways, both of which are important problems, but problems that probably should be addressed different. And if you're looking at how do we do our best work for our customers or how are we tackling whatever and define it that way, that could be different. And so it's a shift in perspective and and a shift in the questions we ask. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Their data and storytelling for hybrid remote is actually interesting as well too, but that's a whole more deep, more in-depth detailed conversation. Is there anything that you wanted to leave people with to, to think about? Maybe you want to talk about 
what we put in the show notes. So your website, your YouTube video, your speaker reel, anything else that you would like? Yeah. To the biggest <laughs> thing is that storytelling is not a soft skill. It is truly <laughs> the way you are going to build trust that you are going to make change that you are going to connect with people. And I feel like attention is the biggest gift people can give. And so you can either waste it by talking at people without preparing, or you can tell dynamic stories and and maximize those moments. And the book is there meant to guide you through that. If you want to get started telling stories, I have a brain food newsletter that has all these different story-based posts that can get you started and thinking about some of these things. And yeah, I look forward to hearing stories from people. Yeah, it'd be great. I love stories. And and the best thing about stories is they're applicable to so many areas in life and so many industries. It's not just knowledge workers. It's you can use it everywhere, right? In any profession. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you so much, Karen. I really appreciate uh, you joining us and uh, I wish you all the best with your book. It's an excellent resource and I really highly recommend it. So thank you so much for having me. Yeah, you're welcome.